Well, hi everybody and welcome to our Socialist Alternative live stream on police brutality, racism and capitalism, justice for George Floyd. My name is Annika, I'm an active member of Socialist Alternative uh, in Melbourne and I will be facilitating the discussion today. I wanted to start the meeting with an acknowledgement of the country on which I sit. I am on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise that in this moment uh, Aboriginal people are still suffering the intense violence and racism of the Australian state and oppose uh, this racism in Australia as well as wanting to fight against the racism all across the globe. So. This meeting uh, was called in response to the brutal murder of George Floyd in um, America. George Floyd was murdered by the police and in response, people rose up and fought back. And we wanted to talk about this murder, but also the uh, courage of protesters and demonstrators all across America who have given inspiration to people all across the globe, including us here in Australia. We're going to hear from two speakers today. The first is uh, that I'd like to introduce you to is Gavin. Um, Gavin is a Gumbangia man um, and is active in Sydney. Uh, he is a leader of a bunch of movements, um, as well as a unionist in the National Tertiary Education Union. So do you want to say hello, Gavin? Hey, Annika, and uh, thank you for having me today. And I just wanted to say hello to everyone out there who's joined us on this live stream today. And I'm currently on Gadigal country in Sydney. Uh, and yeah, I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thanks so much, Gavin. And our other speaker is Vanil. Vanil is, has been a socialist um, for a long time. He's an active member of Social Alternative in Sydney. Um, he's currently the National Union of Students anti-racism officer and has a long history of standing up against racism, fighting in the refugee movement and in anti-fascist campaigns as well. So uh, Vanil, you wanna say hello? Hi Annika, thanks so much for having me and yeah, I wanted to also acknowledge that I'm speaking from Gadigal land today in Sydney, um, pay my respects and also uh, stand in full solidarity with the ongoing struggles of Indigenous people um, as we are in this moment of fighting uh, against racism worldwide. Wonderful, thanks so much Vanil. So obviously um, we've all come to hear uh, Gavin and Vanil uh, talk to us today, but I thought it would be remiss if we didn't uh, take a look at what's going on in the United States. So I wanted to share uh, with all of you um, this, uh, this video. I can't I can't 50 years about enough, time to come back. The history of black people for over 200 and some years in, in, in America has been looking at America's failure. Its capitalist economy could not generate and deliver in such a way that people could live lives of decency. And Martin King already told us about that. When I saw those pictures there in Atlanta, I'm, you could see Martin right there in Atlanta saying, I told you about militarism. I told you about poverty. I told you about materialism. I told you about racism and all of its forms. And what we've seen in America is now these chickens coming home to roost. You're reaping what you sow. You've got a younger generation of all of these different colors and genders and sexual orientation think we won't take it any longer. The system cannot reform itself. Queen Angela done told y'all, grass at the root. So what y'all talking about? Hands up, don't shoot. We've tried black faces in high places, but oftentimes these black faces are losing legitimacy too because the Black Lives Matter movement emerged under a black president, black attorney general, and black homeland security, and they couldn't deliver. I'm not standing down. I'm black and I'm proud and I'm strong. Stand down. And that's what we are strong. No justice. No peace. They're burning down because people here in Minnesota are saying to people in New York, to people in California, to people in Memphis, to people all across this nation, enough is enough. I don't give a damn if they burn down Target. 
This country is supposed to be about the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learned violence from you. Brother Malcolm done told y'all by any means. So what y'all talking about? All on the same team. Look back. Blood on the ground. Look straight. Wow, what a uh, beautiful image of resistance and um, righteous anger at the system. So I thought we should go to our speakers now. And Vanille, could you give us a bit of a picture of what's happening in the United States at the moment? Well, it's really kind of hard to encapsulate, but I think this is one of those moments uh, that is just an, a defining moment in history, the sort of moment that you read about for decades after decades afterwards. And I think what we're witnessing is kind of quite different to what we're often told in the history books, what these moments are like. It's not just the case of like an inspiring leader here or there, but it, it is a genuine mass uprising of people all around the United States. In the words of Tamika Mallory saying, enough is enough. And I think it's worth saying that these uh, protests were sparked by the tragic and horrific murder of George Floyd. But this is about more than just George Floyd. This is about Breonna Taylor. This is about Ahmoud uh, Arbery. This is about Michael Brown. This is about Freddie Gray. This is about Sandra Bland. This is about Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin. This is about James Powell and Emmett Till. This is about the history of an entire system of oppression and injustice that for centuries has oppressed African-American people and ordinary people uh, throughout the United States and around the world. And I think that righteous anger, the protests and the riots and the mass rallies are having such a significant impact. City after city has based Basically been shut down throughout the United States. And I think the racist crimes of the US state are there, that are every day swept under the carpet are there for everyone to see in plain sight. And because of these protests, all of us here know George Floyd's name. We know what was done to him. And we know uh, that things cannot be allowed to go back to normal. We know that we can't just sit by and we know that we have to take action. And that is precisely what we're seeing in the United States. Hundreds of thousands of people, black, white, Latino, Asian, from every background, men, women, from all walks of life, people who have been oppressed for so long, standing up and saying no. And they've been mobilizing for over a week now. The scenes of self-organization, like I could go on and on about the things that we are seeing, whether it's people on the streets of Minneapolis organizing to redistribute the goods that they have looted um, to communities that for so long have not been able to afford them. Um, the fact that, you know, there are, there's a hotel right now in South Minneapolis where homeless people are able to shelter because they have opened up their doors and are self organizing to make sure that people are fed, to make sure that people are, um, you know, have access to hand sanitizers, all that sort of thing. And also the glimpses of working class solidarity that we've seen, whether it's, um, whether it's the construction workers in New York, um, who are basically, who are there, um, like banging uh, bits of wood together in time with the chance, or whether it's the bus drivers who refuse to let the police um, transport prisoners. Um, so these are just some of the glimpses of the, of the incredible scenes that we're seeing. But also, I think this has struck terror into the hearts of the US ruling class and the establishment all around the world because they realize they have no way out of this crisis. And all they have tried to do um, initially was basically brutalize the protest to send in wave after wave of police, of militarized police, of the National Guard, of the army, um, to basically try and put people back in their place. But people heroically, heroically would not back down and they are now lost for what they could do uh for what to do you know like they have basically tried to shut down news of these things by terrorizing journalists they've tried to stop the support networks by firing rubber bullets into medical tents um you know and this is what they have tried and trump has doubled down he's now wielding the insurrection act to try and say that he will send the military onto the streets of major u.s cities he's trying to uh wage a full-scale war on the democracy that people are now displaying in the streets and the republican and democrat mayors and governors and city officials are backing it all up 
and even the, and the police are feeling the pressure of these protests. And you can see that through all the bullshit gestures that they are trying to uh, show as a bit of a PR campaign, quite cynically, kneeling with protesters, um, you know, talking about how outraged they were by um, uh, Fred, sorry, by George Floyd's murder, and then at the same time turning around and tear gassing those protesters they were kneeling aside. So I think what we're seeing right now is a moment that really poses the question, which side are you on? Are you on the side of a racist system that serves the rich and powerful and that keeps the rest of us down? Or are you on the side of thousands of ordinary people, black, white, Latino, workers, students, and the poor demanding justice and who are taking history into their own hands? Wow, thank you so much, um, Vanil. Uh, Gavin, um, what did you want to add? Like, could you give us a bit of um, a sense as well? And maybe we can talk about what's happening around the world in response to the protests uh, in America as well. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Annika. I just, I, I just wanted to echo Vanilla's sentiments. It's the scenes that we're seeing on the streets of Minneapolis and around the country in the United States are absolutely incredible. Finally, finally, we're seeing an uprising in, in the heart of the belly of the beast, you know, global capitalism, the United States is a rupture the black community are rebelling and they're leading an incredible struggle and look all power to them. One of the things that I wanted to kind of touch on was just the, the incredible transformation and shift that's taking place in ordinary people right now on the streets uh, in Minnesota and Minneapolis. And I've got a few kind of interesting examples. One of them was um, there was a protest that was happening in the center of Minneapolis uh, and there was a, a young guy who was driving his partner to hospital and he come across this huge protest that was literally blocking the main uh, street, Chicago Avenue, um, from, you know, police and these kind of things. And so he rocks up to the edge of the protest and he says, look, this is awesome, guys, but I really need to get my partner to the hospital. And they're all standing there saying, come on, joining us, J jump out of the car, stand with us, you know, get on the front lines. And he says to them, look, I will definitely be there but I've got to drop my partner off. And so within minutes, the crowd just organizes this massive split through the center of the street. And the, the guy you know, moves along to the, to the hospital. They get sorted out and hours later, he comes back and joins on the front line. So this is just one of the stories. We've got you know, uh, in Red Flag, a young, woman, a young woman from New York was quoted. Her name was Kayla uh, Janae Johnson. And I think this really just, you know, gives across what's actually taking place in, in the minds of young people. And she says, um, you know, May 26, 2020 was the day that changed my life forever. And she's a 21 year old student in Louisiana. And she said, I stood on the front line shouting, hands up, don't shoot. Now I finally know how us African-Americans felt during the civil rights movement. I'm a part of history. And I think that really encapsulates the concept of ordinary people fighting back and changing history. And the incredible thing is, like you've touched on, Annika, this is more than just a struggle for, uh, against black, uh, for black rights in the United States. This struggle, the resistance in Minneapolis has really been a focal point, of, you know, a flag in the sand for resistance for the oppressed and exploited the world over. And so we've seen incredible scenes from around the globe. So in New Zealand, <laughs> there was a massive protest that happened in Auckland. Um, funnily enough, the liberal centrist Jacinda Ardern has come out against that protest. It should be noted um, for, spirit, for, for reasons I think are questionable. Um, that protest, important to note, it was significant because they're also protesting the rollout of assault rifles for New Zealand police. Uh, and in New Zealand, the rollout there has already seen three people of colour murdered by the police. So the, 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 the way in which this issue is really uh, radicalising young people um, and, force, and pushing them to take up their own issues on the ground and connect them uh, is quite strong. And then we had protests in Germany, you know, thousands on the streets in Germany. We had a protest here in Sydney last night with hundreds on the streets. Uh, we've got, even in the United States, you know, young people, you know, there was a story that came out that said that there was a young woman that, that put one tweet up and got over 700 people at a protest. So it's, it's just incredible. There's solidarity being drawn from all corners of the globe, you know, from Idlib in Syria with pictures of George Floyd painted on, on buildings. You've got Palestine, Palestinians, you know, putting up the call for solidarity for George Floyd uh, as they're fighting for their own, um, you know, people who have been uh, shot and killed by Israeli police. 
Uh, and yeah, I think it's similar scenes that we're seeing around the world. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I've been so moved by the scenes of international solidarity for George Floyd and all of the protesters across the United States. And one of the things I think that is just so beautiful is because we live in a sort of global world where people are always resisting and fighting back, people have a couple of different tactics that they know how to use against um, the police. So uh, when people were fighting um, tear gas um, in uh, cities in America, they got tips from protesters in Hong Kong and Chile of how to deal uh, with those um, attacks. So people are learning from one another, being inspired from one another um, and feeling the confidence and the strength to resist and fight back. And I think that's something really important about the protest tests in America um, today is that um, they do give people that sort of sense that they can fight back and they can resist. I think um, one of the things maybe we could talk about is, well, why are the protests um, happening in America right now and why on such a big scale? I mean, I was reading some statistics and they said that uh, since 2005, between 14,000 and 15,000 people have been killed by the police in the United States and only three of those police officers um, have been, um, have had murder convictions upheld. So. People are killed by the police in America a lot of the time. So why is it that people are fighting back at this scale right now? Um, uh, I mean, uh, Vanil, do you want to give us a bit of a picture about why? Yeah, totally. I think um, there's a bigger picture as well of like the crisis in US capitalism. But I remember I was, uh, I was kind of around when, uh, I mean, not in America, but I was kind of politically active when Black Lives Matter kicked, around, kicked off the first time around. And I think it's important to say that this is not just Black Lives Matter 2.0. This is something that is on a much, much broader scale that is spread across way more cities. Um, and the intensity of the protests is just something uh, that is beyond uh, describing. Um, I saw a stat the other day that there are currently over 350 cities in which there are protests across the United States. And just for context, uh, the last kind of major wave of uh, riots and rebellions across the US was in 1968, after the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. And that was only in 110 cities. So it's on a whole nother scale right now. But I think as well, uh, the experience of the past uh, six years, and I think in particular of the Obama presidency, uh, has really re revealed a whole lot about US society. Because one of the things that happened with Black Lives Matter last time around was the lie of the system that that with more black mayors and with more black police chiefs, and of course with the first black president, that things would get somehow better. But of course, Obama spent eight years of his presidency doing what? He spent eight years of his presidency bailing out Wall Street and siding uh, with the rich and powerful. He spent eight years of his presidency um, continuing uh, to back up the police force that were continuing to take black lives. And he spent eight years of his presidency denouncing black protesters whenever they would try and demand real justice. And now we're seeing people like him, people like Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor of Atlanta, um, come out and basically once again try and say, yes, of course, we're all um, kind of, uh, we're all saddened by what's happened with George Floyd and we can understand the anger, but we need to go back to more productive channels. We need to go back and uh, basically vote. And they do this as well, but while wielding a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of rhetoric that no white politician would ever be able to get away with, like basically demonizing the criminal behavior, supposedly, of the protesters in the streets, um, talking about them running around with liquor in their hands, absolutely disgusting sorts of stereotypes. Um, and so what's the solution they're offering? These, they're basically saying, uh, go home and vote. Vote for who? Vote for the Democrats, like another party of corporate America, the party of slavery. Vote for Joe Biden. Joe, shoot the protesters in the, le in the legs, Biden. Joe Biden, who co-wrote the 1994 Crime Bills Act that resulted in a spike in mass incarceration of black and brown youth. Joe Biden, who basically uh, was, you know, part of defending segregation. That Joe Biden. I think it's really inspiring now that we have a new generation of activists who are saying, fuck that. Joe Biden is not going to save us. The Democrats are not going to save us. We're going to show you exactly how to fight Donald Trump. It's not uh, using the ballot box. It's not using this bullshit political process that has failed communities around the country year after year. They are basically taking action themselves and saying, 
And we are the ones who are going to win justice and we're going to take action um, into our own hands. Yeah, right on. Uh, Gavin, did you want to add anything? Yeah, definitely. I, I think I think Vanille's right in, in really touching on the just the reality of policing and oppression and and how the past struggles and resistance and Black Lives Matter movements have have fed into this uprising, but that actually the character and movement that we're seeing today is completely, um, you know, transformed, I think, from previous struggles in, in the scope, in the breadth and in the depth and how far it actually is touching in, in America, the United States with ordinary people. And I think that has a lot to do with capitalism. That has a lot to do with the fact that the system that we currently live in, and we've got to remember the United States, they don't have free healthcare. You know, we've got Medicare, how, however crap it is, we've got, got some form of, um, you know, basic healthcare system. They're currently going through one of the most significant and deepest economic crises of US history. It's the, the, the amount of profits and money that's been lost in the first quarter of, these, of, of this period is quite significant. And when the rich, when the ruling class start to lose money, you know, start to... Uh, you know, drop in their profits when they start to lose money in their pay packets. Effectively, they start to look to working class people, the ordinary people, in order to balance their checks. And that effectively means attacking the wages and conditions of working class people, but also all of the government social services that, that come along with, you know, the taxes that we pay. So, for example, housing, education, welfare, all of these things. In the United States, it's been... It's been horrible for working class people generally, but when it comes to working class black people, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis. It's a crisis on top of a crisis. The, the Chicago Teachers Union uh, recently uh, released an excellent um, motion in support of the uprising in which they detailed the lived experiences of, of black students of which 80% of Chicago schools are. Uh, and they went through how, you know, they had to buy, they, they're out there buying their kids' lunches, they're buying the kids' materials to teach in class, they're buying the, the key resources for those kids. So you're dealing with a, a system in which working class people are, are, are trodden on repeatedly. Healthcare is non-existent. Education is pretty much like, yeah, subpar completely and and then you have on top of that the massive crisis of COVID in which you have working class people literally being thrown on a scrap heap. You know, when the, when the outbreak of COVID, there was over 10 million working class people made unemployed. The work, you know, the United States is a large population, but that's, that's a lot of people who now just don't know where their money is coming from to put food on the table. They're relying on the government of Donald Trump to fund for resources and, you know, fund food care packages and all these kind of things. And we know that that's just, that's obviously not meeting their needs. And as Cornell West said quite clearly, it's a crisis of capitalism. Capitalism is in decay. It's not democratic. It does not provide for working class people and especially not black working class people. And that's why this struggle is so explosive, but also so multiracial. It's not just young black people who are out there wanting to smash the system, wanting to rip the head off police. It's young white working class people, it's migrant working class people, it's very multiracial. And it's about actually putting forward an argument that says, this world, we do everything, you know, we need to be looked after. You know, the reality that there's riot police right now running around the streets of the United States with equipment that costs up to $850 per right gear, yet it would only cost $14.50 to provide PPE for one nurse in one of those hospitals in the United States. There's nurses now who are dying from catching COVID because they don't have adequate PPE. I think that really tells you everything you need to know about the reality of the US capitalism and why young people are out in the streets fighting today. Yeah, I think that's so right, uh, Gavin. Like, you can see the sort of total disparity that exists in America, one of the richest, well, the richest nation in the world, and yet so many people are dying because of coronavirus, have no access to healthcare, as you say. And 
well, going back to the protests, I mean, one of the things that they did in Minneapolis is uh, as they looted the stores, they made them available, uh, the food and uh, things that they got out of Target and wherever, um, and made them available for people, which, as you say, like, we make everything, so why shouldn't uh, we be able to um, grab it? Um, I just want to pause the discussion again, uh, just to uh, make a call out to people who might have joined the meeting a little bit late, but uh, we're going to have discussion uh, at the end of the meeting in the form of breakout rooms, and the way we're facilitating that is by state. So if people want to add uh, their um, state to the end of their name, just rename themselves, and we can do that. And I also wanted to make a uh, sort of uh, announcement about um, Socialist Alternative uh, and our Get Involved form. We run a, a bunch of activity around the country. Um, at the moment, a lot of it's online because of the coronavirus question, but we have a form that you can fill out, redflag.org.au um, slash get involved, um, where you can fill in your details and find out about events that are happening um, in your city or on your Zoom account. So people should definitely um, fill in their details on that to stay in touch with everything that's happening um, across Australia. Um, so, well, thank you guys both so, so much for um, your uh, contributions there. And I think um, we've gotten a bit of a sense of the sort of the, the intense crisis, I guess, that exists in the American state. Um, I think that one of the other things that uh, has been pushing people, uh, both of you mentioned Donald Trump, um, and I think people have been rightly outraged by um, the tweets that he's been putting out, um, the press statements. I mean, the one that we saw yesterday morning where uh, he said that no matter what governors um, think, the military and the National Guard and the police will be sent in to dominate the streets. But one of the tweets that he made was when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Um, and I mean, it's not just Trump, but liberal media, um, especially the ABC News, constantly sort of attack um, demonstrators um, for so-called violent um, protests. Um, and they often say that this hurts the cause, if only people stay peaceful. What do you think about that, uh, Gavin? <laughs> I think it's outrageous. I think it's, I wanna swear. <laughs> I think it's disgusting. How could you tell these people to stop resisting when look what they're fighting against. Look what they're fighting against. Benil just went through all of the prominent cases of, of uh, you know, black cases of people being murdered by the police in the United States. That's just some of the prominent cases where we've seen mass movements being organized around them. There's one case every eight hours in the United States of a black person being murdered by the government. That's just, the way black people get treated. The, the, the American state, as most, as all capitalist states actually, have a monopoly on violence. Nobody calls out the violence of the state. Nobody calls out the fact that, you know, people dying at the, outside of hospitals of COVID um, is, is some, seems to be okay under capitalism. It's like, that's violence. The government refusing to fund healthcare is violence towards working class people. The government sending out the bloody SWAT team to smash up a protest when they're democratically protesting for justice for George, uh, George Floyd, that's violence. The government refusing to fund welfare for communities uh, and working class communities and poor communities and those communities going destitute, that's violence. We have to talk about the violence of the state, the violence of the people in power, the violence of the people who run this system. The violence of the oppressed is in no way comparable. You cannot equate the two. The violence of the oppressed is supportable because the oppressed have a right to resist. I'm not going to tell someone in America that they can't smash a window or, you know, get out in the streets because their, their brother or their cousin has just been murdered by the government. The government doesn't even like that they take a knee. Look what they did to, you know, that, that black man playing football. Look, look, at, look at how they treated, look at how they treated him. Look at, look at what they did to these people who stand up. It's outrageous to even suggest that, you know, the community can't resist. It's absolutely outrageous. And I think what we have to recognise is that actually we wouldn't know the names of these people if, if it wasn't for the resistance of their community. If we wouldn't know the names and the, camp and, and, and the struggles around, you know, people like Tamir Rice if it wasn't for the struggles of their communities and if it wasn't for them rioting. So actually in many ways the riots have done a lot more 
to further the, the campaign for black rights and for justice for, for black people murdered by the police, I think, than, you know, than we've seen in the past. And I, I just, yeah, I, I, I'm outraged about it because I think, it's, I think it's appalling. And I think, you know, we need to get on with the job of standing in solidarity alongside those who want to fight back because, you know, the fight back has been a long time coming and we need to encourage it at every opportunity that we get. Yeah, I really agree. Um, Socialist Alternative puts out a, a newspaper called Red Flag, and there was a recent article in there by one of our editors, Daniel Taylor, uh, which he titled, um, Thank You, Rioters, uh, and talking about the spirit and courage of people fighting back. V Vanille, did you want to um, add as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, it's important to recognise that riots can often be the catalyst of like mass movements and actually more struggles are uh, being brought to the forefront. Um, and the fact that now as a result of these protests, there are 350 cities um, engaged, there are hundreds of thousands of people. So I think it has to be seen that, you know, riots have an important role to play as part of a broader social movement um, to actually um, challenge oppression and to tear down inequality. But I've got to say, when I first um, heard about and saw the scenes of uh, the protesters in Minneapolis burning down the police station there. Um, the first thought that crossed my mind was actually about, well, trying to imagine what life was like for uh, African-American people in these communities before these protests began. Like, can you imagine walking past that target every single day where cops and security have their eyes glued on you, where the things that you need are there but you can't afford them, or you're so poor because you're relegated to like low paid menial jobs and Target is the only place you can afford to shop. Um, you know, imagine walking past the branches of banks like Wells Fargo that threw you uh, onto the street or repossessed the homes of your friends and family during the GFC. Um, you know, imagine the resentment, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, being left to die in the COVID crisis while the corporations get bailed out. Imagine walking past that third uh, precinct police station every day. And uh, it's just like a reminder that any single moment you could be harassed, you could be arrested, you could be beaten, you could be shot. Imagine the friends uh, lost or families broken by that building. Imagine walking past that monument of oppression with your children on the way to school being paralyzed with fear for their future. And imagine feeling the weight of that oppression every waking moment that your life doesn't matter, that you have no control over your life, let alone the world that you live in, and that feeling that you can't do a damn thing about it. Now you imagine what it must have felt like then for hundreds of people in Minneapolis to burn those fucking buildings to the ground to basically say that we're not gonna take this shit anymore. They didn't just smash windows, they didn't just burn buildings, they were breaking their own chains and saying, fuck you, we matter, we won't take this shit anymore, we're gonna control our own streets, we're gonna have our own say over our own communities and our own world. And I think when people resist, they're reclaiming their humanity from a society that has deprived it from them for way too long. And whether it's protests, whether it's rioting, whether it's strikes, I support that unconditionally. I will cheer and celebrate every single time that it happens. Because oppressed people are not passive victims waiting around to be saved and liberated by some savior from on high. People resisting themselves on the ground is how we win our demands and how we will liberate ourselves. And I think those who resist, they need our solidarity. They don't need us to abandon them when they choose to resist in a way that we personally disagree with or have misgivings about. Because the reality is, like Gavin mentioned, there is no form of resistance that will ever be acceptable to the people in power. And it doesn't matter, like, uh, Gavin said, if it's Colin Kaepernick kneeling before a football game or Martin Luther King marching on the streets of Selma peacefully, they don't hate how we struggle. They hate the fact that we struggle at all. They would rather we didn't do it. And that's what it's all about. And, you know, that's why we've had leaders after leaders um, coming out basically saying like, yes, we understand. Please go away. And, you know, the thing that's really sickened me is the way in which they try and, you know, play good protesters off against bad protesters um, and they try and equate the violence of the oppressed with the violence of the oppressor and the way in which they try and weaponize and sanitize the legacy of people like Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement to try and beat uh, protesters into submission. And it's great to see that there's all these quotes and coverage coming out about how Martin Luther King was radical. But I think there's one quote in particular that um, I kept thinking of that's been missing. And this is from a speech that Martin Luther King gave in 1967 when he finally came out against the war in Vietnam and after he'd been touring um, neighborhoods all across the United States States um, after riots erupted there. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, 
I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems, but they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. Wow, what a powerful um, quote. I think that really sort of encapsulates uh, what's happening. And I think both of your points, Gavin and Vanille, I think reflect and echo that, that the violence that exists in our society is the state and the government and the police and the welfare system that constantly berate and attack ordinary people, take their lives and take their dignity. And I agree with you both. How dare people talk about protesters in this manner? We support and we celebrate and we stand in solidarity with those people who are fighting back. They have shown everyone around the world that you can win and you can be strong and you can stand together and fight. And I just think that that is so special and important and amazing. Vanille, you're a bit of an expert on Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the civil rights movement in America. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, sort of the last big moment of um, sort of resist black resistance in America? And I don't know if there's any connections to what's happening today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's an example of like when the world changed and was changed by the masses of people, which is something that is written out of the history books quite often. Like it's shown as just being like, you know, uh, Martin Luther King giving some inspiring speeches, quarter million people turn up at Washington, and then all of a sudden we have the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Rather, actually, it was a mass, mass movement of millions of people across the United States um, in sit-ins across segregated lunch counters, the Montgomery bus boycott, the countless marches that took place. Uh, these were radical moments in history that involved thousands of people. And there were riots, yes, there were strikes um, by people like the um, Memphis uh, sanitation workers in 1968. And it was these actions, it was the fact that um, society couldn't be allowed to go on as it was that forced uh, the ruling class in the United States to have to give up some concessions to try and regain control of the situation. So, you know, there's a lot of gains that were made in that movement. But I think what we see today is that a lot of those gains, are, you know, are still under attack. And actually, we still don't have liberation and the destruction of racism um, uh, in our society. Racism is still pervasive. Um, and, you know, police brutality is still pervasive. So I think what we're looking at now is the unfinished business of the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King had a dream where he by the end of his life was talking about we need to basically um, end racial oppression we need to end militarism and we also need to end capitalism he was against capitalism as a system and I think that is the unfinished task of the civil rights movement to get rid of the system that creates the shit in the first place and Gavin, you um, know a lot about uh, Indigenous resistance in Australia as well. Did you want to talk a little bit about that, um, the sort of Black Power movement in Australia? Yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the interesting things, and I think uh, it's an interesting phenomenon throughout history, is that the, the kind of core leading areas like the United States, leading countries in terms of global powers do influence what's going on around the world. So the black power movement in Australia was massively influenced by the black power struggle uh, over in the United States and in particular, the black Panthers. So, you know, in the sixties and seventies, you had the similar cultural iconography that we saw with the activists and also the kind of political um, tendencies uh, in terms of black nationalism and these kind of things. But more generally, uh, I think at the heart of it was a similar core demand, you know, the 60s were a radical time. People thought that we were going to change the world. Like people thought there was going to be a revolution, that we're going to have socialism uh, in, in a few years. You know, these are times where people th thought that they were changing the world. And in Sydney and in Melbourne and in Brisbane and as well as on the other side of the country, we had some serious protest movements being organised with key activists like Gary Foley, um, and a bunch of other leading activists that were associated with the Communist Party in Australia. So people like um, uh, former member of the Builders Labourers Federation, Kevin Cook, um, Uncle Chica Dixon, who was a member of the Waterside Workers Federation uh, and, and a communist. So there's, 
there's these serious um, uh, struggles, I think, that at the heart of them are about transforming society and putting your body on the line and throwing all, all your lot in. And at the core of that, you know, oppression, similar to what we're seeing play out in the streets in, in the uh, United States in Minneapolis, uh, was one of the key responses that they were that they were dealt with. They they were fighting against oppression, and then they had to fight against police brutality and violence in order to smash oppression. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, as Vanilla just went through, a lot of those dreams weren't realised because the reality is we still live under capitalism. And I think you know, obviously, we can go into that a bit more. But yeah, yeah. Um... Well, I mean, there's so many moments of inspiring resistance by um, people in America and Australia and obviously all around the world. But I think one of the things that we should talk about is the violence and racism of the Australian state. We've got uh, in Australia a murderous history uh, and the cops in Australia are no better, um, despite what the media will have you think. Um, I mean, just this week, a police officer um, brutally smashed a young man's face into the concrete and the excuse that was given about that was that he was having a bad day, uh, which is absolutely abhorrent and disgusting. But Gavin, do you want to talk about um, Indigenous deaths in custody and the, the violence of the Australian state? Yeah, definitely, Annika. I mean, I, I, just on that case you were talking about, for it to happen, you know, immediately after what had just taken place in the United States, uh, really shows that they, the, there's a hubris about the police. They really think that they run society. And when you think about it, the rich, the government, they they give the police free reign to do what they want. And so those actions that we see, you know, um, you know, the, the the cop who killed George Floyd smiling while he's leaning on George Floyd's neck, or you know, the the officers who arrest a Aboriginal people in the streets in the Northern Territory. Um, smiling while they're throwing in the back of paddy wagons. There was an image that went around just a couple of days about that as well. The reality is that Australia is deeply racist. It's, it's one of the most racist countries uh, in human history, I think. And it is the just the case that although different in, in terms of context, Aboriginal people face similar forms of brutality and violence uh, by the state and by the police. So in Australia, um, we've got a history of fighting back against um, black, you know, the deaths of Aboriginal people in custody, uh, which culminated in the campaign for, uh, for black deaths in custody in the 80s and 90s. That resulted in a Royal Commission in 91, which basically gave all these recommendations, 338 in total, um, in order to, you know, as the Royal Commissioner would say, stop black deaths in custody. Effectively, only three of those uh, recommendations were implemented since 1991 around the country. And since the Royal Commission, we've, have, we've had over 430 Aboriginal people murdered in custody. That's 430 since 1991. And I can give you just a, a bit of an idea of what these cases look like. We have the case of young um, David Dungay. He was a young Aboriginal man from Kempsey, a Dungati man. He was 26 years old, locked up in, in Long Bay Prison here in Sydney. Now, in 2016, he was in his cell. Uh, he was eating his Tim Tams. And because he, uh, the officers in, the, in, in prison like to, you know, throw their weight around in their authority. So they told him not to. And he said, fuck that, I'm going to eat my Tim Tams. And so they, they being six to seven like militarized prison guards went into the prison cell, pinned him down, ejected a sedative that's used on horses into him. And then he would literally be lying there as they're holding him down, screaming, I can't breathe. And he screams, I can't breathe 11 times. And he dies. We've just had, uh, uh, not long ago, we've had the, the inquest into the, the murder of David Dungay. And in classic racist Australian state fashion, the courts have found that there was no wrongdoing from the correctional officers. And so what we're seeing is a similar pattern, a murder, a cover up and carry on business as usual. Murder, cover up, carry on business as usual. 
And for Aboriginal people, it's not just that, you know, the police, because of their social position, are racist scumbags. It's that we live under a system that fundamentally relies on the oppression, exploitation and subjugation of working class people. And for Aboriginal people, that's more intensified because we, we were here first. We literally led a serious struggle against the colonial state and it was fundamental. It, 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 you know, Australian capitalism could not have existed unless they in instituted the racism, the genocide, the rape, the massacre, and then the ongoing oppression that Aboriginal people experience today. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure a lot of us here have been to demonstrations fighting for justice for people murdered by uh, Aboriginal people murdered by the Australian state. Vanil, do you want to talk a little bit about racism in Australia as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think the point that Gavin ended with is really right, because there has to be something about our society that continually means that Aboriginal people are treated like this way in their own country, um, that continually leads to incidences of police brutality, of like the over-incarceration of Indigenous people in prisons, the fact that, you know, there's that statistic that still uh, is there, which is that um, most, if not all, of the um, youth in uh, detention in the Northern Territory are Indigenous, and the fact that here in New South Wales, the New South Wales Police has a secret watch list of Indigenous children, um, some as young as nine, who are basically um, constantly picked up and harassed um, and kind of monitored by the police. So this sort of shit continues um, every single day, um, precisely because of the things that Gavin uh, went through, that actually in order for capitalism in Australia to be, um, to be founded, actually they had to completely demonise and uh, not recognise the humanity of Indigenous people um, who were here um, to basically construct a society where, yeah, a, a tiny minority could subjugate everyone else and use the land, use its resources, use its people um, to whatever extent that they wanted. And that you can see all the threads of that today. Today it's the mining industries that want to rip up in, uh, native title and basically steal more and more indigenous land so they can build things like the Adani coal mine, so they can explore, um, you know, for gas and all the other minerals uh, that will, you know, make them rich but completely destroy um, the lands of indigenous people. And so I think, yeah, these, uh, the system uh, is something that continually produces this sort of uh, horror and subjugation and I think it's also why it lets the police off with impunity as well because the police are an institution that's there to protect the rich and powerful and so when the police come under attack when their legitimacy is questioned the system closes ranks around the very people that are there to defend uh, to defend them and I think that's what uh, it's important to see this uh, as a systemic problem and not something uh, that will easily be reformed it's something that's going to require a lot of struggle um, in order to win basic justice but we're going to need even more struggle for a fundamental transformation uh, of the world that we live in. Absolutely and it's Indigenous people and it's refugees and it's migrants who are the target of the racism from the Australian state and we know it's not just the Liberal government but the Labor government is complicit and supportive of all of this as well. I mean, you just got to think about the comments from Christina Keneally, um, the Shadow Immigration Minister, not just tailing um, the racism of the Liberals, but uh, actually, you know, outflanking them to the right, uh, attacking so-called plain migrants. Um, there's the white Australia policy. There is just, uh, you know, moment after moment of the sordid racism of the Australian state. Um, and I just, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about well, why is that? Why is there this ongoing oppression across the globe against black and brown people? Why hasn't racism um, in that sense um, gone away? And um, why does it exist in our society? Um, Gavin, do you want to start us off? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I, I think the reality is that under capitalism, and we've kind of gone through this in the other points, but literally it, it's it's the most productive system in human history uh, but it's also the most uh divided in terms of wealth you know we live in a class divided society where you have one section of the population the working class who produce everything but who don't have any say who have absolutely no control over what they do with their labor or the things that they produce and actually they, they don't have any you know real control over the broader political arena as well and then you have the ruling class the people who own all of the workplaces all of the factories um you know the the places that produce 
uh, but that they pay workers in order to produce their commodities. They then take those commodities and sell it on a market for a profit that doesn't obviously ever see the, the workers pocket. And you can't have such an unequal, such a, an oppressive social system without racism. It just cannot exist. You have to be able to say to those large masses of working people that you're exploiting that have so much power, because if they strike, they shut down your entire economy. You have to say to them, the enemy is not me, the one who's taking your wages, who's you know, not giving you health care, who's refusing to give you decent housing. The enemy, enemy is not me. The enemy is the, your brown colleague or the, your migrant colleague or the other person here that looks a bit different. So you've got to blame them. So it's, it's fundamentally about divide and rule. It's about pitting working people against each other. And effectively, it's about you know, creating a landscape for the rich so they can hyper exploit working people, get on with the business of making profits and have working class people biting at each other's necks instead of biting at the necks of the rich who are actually the ones who you know cause this crisis and who uh, cause, create racism, and so we have to look at you know these these we have to look at these moments and and really analyze what is the state doing, where is it, where is it coming from, and how can we actually challenge it? And I think you know talking about racism as a as a means of divide and rule of the working class, I think it centers our solution about how we actually challenge racism. Uh, in the power of the working class by using the power of the working class. Yeah, Vanil, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the um, the way that Gavin's described it is really important because there can be a real tendency out there to present capitalism as just like a dry economic system and you've got capitalism over here and you've got like racism and forms of oppression and social structures and politics on the other side. Whereas it's important to say that like racism is a product of capitalism uh, like Gavin went through. It is something that is uh, created and perpetuated and reshaped and reinforced uh, by the system, by the structures in society, by the people who have wealth and power in society to protect that wealth and power and to exploit the rest of us and uh, and i think the point of divide and rule as a real uh, important form of social control uh is important to recognize because that kind of goes um, that can be seen in the history of racism both in australia and the united states in the united states the formulation of racism began when there were rebellions in the 1600s um, in places like virginia where over 500 um, black uh, slaves and white indentured servants united together to basically like burn down the manor of the governor there like uh in, and they rioted and this actually struck fear into the hearts of the ruling class who realized shit if we have poor black people and poor white people together fighting this is going to end very very badly for us. And so there was a concerted effort to enshrine in law um, to basically create differences in people's living conditions and how much, uh, you know, uh, in, in poverty and all the economic circumstances they found themselves in to divide them and pit them against each other. And I think uh, this is something that the civil rights movement really challenged. Like Martin Luther King uh, basically recognized that capitalism uh, was a driving force and interlinked with racism. Uh, Malcolm X recognized exactly the same thing. And the civil rights movement actually by bringing together black and white people um, in, uh, in a common uh, struggle against the entirety of the system uh, basically scared the ruling class again. And I think ever since the civil rights movement, what have we seen? We've seen things like the war on drugs, the attempt to basically criminalize and demonize black people who were some of the most inspiring leaders of that civil rights movement uh, and to try and make people fearful of black people again, to over incarcerate them, to oppress them. Uh, and this has been bipartisan policy by Republicans and Democrats together. But I think Gavin's really right to say the solution actually lies um, in the working class because the working class is a multiracial class. It is people from every racial background. It is people from every uh, gender identity, from every sexual orientation. And we together have a common interest actually to struggle together, to fight to improve our conditions, to make sure that none of us are oppressed or ground down or beaten up by the police. But also we have a common interest in taking over this society and running it for ourselves. Um, and I think that is uh, something that working class people can do because we go to work every single day, we produce the wealth of this system, but the problem is that we don't control any of that wealth, we don't get to say what happens with it. And I think racism hurts that struggle against the system because it pits us against each other, it makes us blame each other, makes us hate each other, and lets the people at the top 
off the hook. And I think it's those struggles as well then that challenge that racism that shows people, well, your struggle is my struggle. We're all, we are actually in this together, not in the bullshit way that Scott Morrison talks about, but actually working class people, doesn't matter your race, religion, gender or sexuality, we are in this together and we have to fight the rich if the world can, is ever going to be changed. Thank you um, so much for that. Um, I think that it's so important to understand why we need to get rid of the system of capitalism in order to undo uh, and get rid of the racism um, and the oppression that we see in our, in our world today. And I think it's not just racism, but sexism and homophobia and all of the other oppression um, that we uh, sort of feel the um, crushing effect of or see on um, you know, our brothers and sisters um, that all of these types of oppression are caused by a murderous, unequal and undemocratic system. I wanted to make an announcement about a meeting that Socialist Alternative is hosting uh, on the weekend. We've got an amazing activist from America. He is from Chicago um, and was involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, his name is Todd um, St. Hill. It's going to be happening on Sunday at 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And um, Gavin and uh, Vanille have done a very good job of talking about what's going on in America. but. Uh, the, I think they're the next best thing compared to uh, hearing from someone actually in America participating in the demonstrations um, and the fight back that's going on. So um, Liz has posted the link to that event in the comments so people can um, click attending and going to that. One of the things that Liz also put in the uh, chat was a link to our Marxism discussion group. So Gavin and Vanille have both talked about the system of capitalism and the way that it oppresses, divides, crushes ordinary people. And one of the things that we do at these Marxism discussion groups is talk about that system of capitalism and also talk about what it is we can do um, to get rid of it. So maybe we should talk about then, Gavin and Vanille, like, what is it, what can we do now? Like, I'm angry and I, I want to fight back and I want to tear this whole system down, but how do I do it? Um, Gavin, tell me how. Yeah, look, I love it. You, you, we've got to, everyone's got to have that fire. And obviously it's out there. Young people want to hit the streets. And I think that's excellent. What we need to do, I think in, obviously in the first instance, you need to show solidarity. We need to get to the streets. We need to, we need to get organised uh, and we need to get active. But I think broader, of the broader question is, how are we going to take this struggle? How are we going to take this incredible energy and, and push for the future? push for the kind of revolutionary transformation of society that we actually want to see and that we actually want to, that we actually need. The incredible thing about Minneapolis and about the struggles that are breaking out around the world is that it's really connecting people, the oppressed and working class people, to the idea that it's time to fight back. Now, the question is, how do we do that? How do we get there? What are the politics that we need in order to achieve the kind of society that we want to live in where we decide everything, where the working class gets to choose and where the working class has a say. And I think that we have to have socialist politics. We need more socialists. The reality is that revolutions don't create themselves, unfortunately. If they did, we'd be in socialism by now. We need more activists on the ground who are making the arguments about what's actually taking place and how struggles like uh, the struggles like that that are taking place in the United States right now lay the basis for the future, for the struggles that we can actually have to win a better world. And so what I would encourage everyone to do here is get involved in Socialist Alternative. I've been a member for six years now. Honestly, it's changed my life. I could, could not imagine, you know, getting involved in what I have been if I hadn't been a socialist and someone who, you know, wanted to hit the streets and bite the neck of the system. So I would definitely encourage everyone in the live stream today to get involved, to, you know, get active and, you know, I'm going to be in the chat after, so if you have any questions, we can go from there. Uh, Vanil? Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. I think immediately everyone needs to get to your local protest in solidarity with the US. If you want to find the details for that, uh, they were posted in the event on Facebook, as well as you can check out the NUS Against Racism page. You can find the details there. People in the US were fighting right now against growing um, you know, police repression against the most militarized and powerful state that has ever existed, need our solidarity. They need every single ounce of solidarity they can get from uh, around the world. And the more of it, the better. We need to fight. We need to fight for reforms. We need to fight 
for justice here, but we also need to see that if our struggles are defeated anywhere, if they crush the protests in the US, that is a loss for our struggle here. And if the people in the US can push forward, if they can win victories, that is a win for the uh, struggle against oppression everywhere in the world. Their struggle is our struggle and we need to fight that together. So definitely get to the protests. But I think Gavin is absolutely right. Capitalism has to be overthrown. The civil rights movement did not go far enough. It left intact the system that needed to claw back um, its power and its wealth um, from uh, that momentary challenge. And here's the thing. I don't want to be basically back in a week's time fighting the next injustices. I don't want to be back in a year's time or five years time or 10 years time or 50 years time. I want to fight to change the world permanently where we don't have to constantly be fighting this shit all the time and i think that means that the rule of the one percent the capitalist class needs to be ended we need to have a working class revolution where ordinary working class people take control of that society where basically um the people in power who currently um arm the police the people in power who whip up racism they no longer have the power to or the wealth to do any of that thing we have the power and the wealth to reorganize a society that can actually fulfill human need make sure no one is a and where we have genuine democracy and freedom to make sure everyone can have a decent standard of living. But that doesn't just mean that socialists uh, wait around for the revolution. We have to be organized today. Um, but I think what we do today, and as Gavin argued, the politics that we have today um, matters. We have to see every single victory in our struggles as a stepping stone uh, to basically an ult uh, to uh, the ultimate struggle we're going to need to tear down this system. Every single struggle, every single victory is about people's ideas changing. It's about us building up our confidence and our organization. And the politics that you have going into that matters. It matters in how you respond to the state. Do you think a couple of cops kneeling on the street are on your side and you should go home? That's a political question you need to answer. Do you think you can trust the politicians? That's a political question you need to answer. But their voices right now are stronger than ours. So we need to organize so that our voices um, can help try and push struggle forward um, when things happen. And here's the thing, people like Martin Luther King, people like the thousands upon thousands of people in the civil rights movement dedicated their lives. They gave up so much to try and push forward a struggle for ultimate liberation. And it's a tragedy that that struggle, um, you know, was cut short, particularly for people like Martin Luther King. And so now it's our responsibility to pick up that torch, to take it as far forward as it can go, and to make sure that we create a world that is fit for everyone to live in. Uh, so I think if you want to be part of that process, you can't just sit on the sidelines you got to jump in right now thank you so much uh, for those really powerful words gavin and vanille and i just agree so much people have to be part of the fight and resist and stand up against every oppression uh, that they see and that they witness and we need to take the um the spirit of the people in minneapolis and new york and houston and atlanta and everywhere and keep um fighting in melbourne and sydney and all around the country there's going to be opportunities to begin that fight back and begin to start uh, resisting. Um, protests have been called in solidarity with the uh, mass uprising uh, that is uh, burning across the United States. And so um, there's a link in the chat uh, to find out about the protests, but if the chat closes before you can link, click on it um, in the event page and also on national uh, NUS against racism, um, there is a link to all of the protests. Well, thank you so much, um, Gavin and Vanille, for those inspiring words. Um, and I know that I am now invigorated and ready to um, begin the fight. So if people haven't already gotten in contact with Socialist Alternative or you don't know your local socialist, uh, you can um, get in touch with them by going onto redflag.org.au slash get involved and filling out your contact details um, and uh, that way being part of the fight. <laughs>